Now, the next chapter from the Rainbow Machine Tales from a Neurolinguist Journal is Patching Holes. And I have to confess, this is a bit awkward for me these days. Essentially, this chapter is about a miracle that I performed on the neurosurgical unit on which I was working at the time. To cut a very long story short, um, a gentleman had a condition that wasn't being, um, wasn't treatable from what they were doing. Uh, he was a very angry man as a result because the, the problem he had actually had been induced by some of the other treatment he had received. This has caused a complication which was then going to have some significant uh, impacts upon his quality of life. And as you can imagine, he was quite angry. Now I did a very simple NLP stroke hypnotherapy technique. Uh, performed conversationally with him and I got him to basically change the picture he had in his head of his condition and miracle he recovers so I of course took full credit for the miracle that was performed um, but this is one of those things that correlation is not necessarily causation and these things could just be coincidental one of the things I've become so aware of in recent years, because back then there wasn't things like YouTube, and I don't even think the internet was much of a thing back then. It was just the, the beginnings of it. So the information and the opportunity for self-promotion wasn't really at everyone's fingertips as it is today. And if we look on things like YouTube and people's web pages and all sorts of other areas where people are able to promote themselves like social media, the claims for miracles made by coaches, therapists, practitioners across all disciplines is just phenomenal. And most of it is entirely false. Just because somebody thinks they have healed somebody doesn't mean they've healed somebody. Just because I'm a new code NLP trainer and I work with cancer patients and all sorts of physiological disorders over there in, in near London, I won't give it an address, um, doesn't mean I have any results whatsoever, but it does mean I can keep telling people, yes, I'm, I work regularly with cancer patients. Well, this is absolute nonsense, of course. So what we have is an epidemic, especially since the days of COVID, there's an epidemic of healers of every description um, claiming every possible cure they can ever have. And this kind of drives me nuts. And, I, and some of you will be aware, I've been very, very critical of, of a lot of these trainers and practitioners in, in the recent year or two, or the past year or two. And of course, have received a lot of flack and negative commentary and counter accusations, which are, of course, entirely false. Um, in response to that, but I'm not going to stop questioning and challenging people to do this. If you are constantly healing people of Parkinson's disease, of cancer, of multiple cirrhosis, of all these things, film it. Just film it. Let's see what you do. Let's have access to the medical file. Let's actually get medical, independent medical evaluation and, and present that on camera. Think what's going to happen to your career if you are that healer who can actually demonstrate evidence. It's not much to ask, is it? It's not much to ask. One of the things I used to be critical of was hypnotherapists who would tell me all sorts of stories. This is when I was going around practice groups and all sorts of, you know, courses and things like that. So I was meeting lots of practitioners, trainers and hypnotherapists of varying sorts and they would tell me all the grandstanding stories about how hypnotherapy can do this, it can do that, and how you can completely stop pain and, and you can change the blood flow in your fingers. They would tell me all these great stories. I have to confess, when I was younger, I used to repeat those stories too. And people have repeated those stories to me. I've repeated them to other people. Everyone's telling the stories. Where's the video? And surely, if you're a hypnotherapist and you believe that you can alter blood flow and that kind of stuff, Film it. Let's see it being done. Let's see some demonstration of it. Because merely claiming these things happen isn't evidence of these things happening. And this is one of the questions I do have for people. Where's all the evidence? We've got all these miracles being performed daily. And it seems that since the advent of video cameras, the frequency of miracles being performed in the world has plummeted quite significantly. But the claims for miracles being performed has gone up dramatically. There's a story I do want to share from one of the neuro centers that I worked in. I worked in a, just a, a small number, and I don't want to name the specific one for anonymity's sake. And this was the incident of a young woman who had had a head injury and wasn't expected to survive initially. So she's initially brought into hospital via, via paramedics and all the rest of it. 
goes through accident and emergency, whisked off to emergency surgery where teams and teams of people are trying to save this young woman's life. She um, is transferred from there into the intensive care and again, teams of people looking after her. And over that period of time, she's going back for repeated surgeries to try and save her. And this goes on for weeks. And you can imagine how many people are involved in that person's care. A lot of experts, there's, there's case conferences on a regular basis. Other experts internationally are brought in to consult on that. Lots and lots of people involved. Um, everything from the technicians to the nurses to the doctors to the researchers and the, and the, the techs and also. Eventually, she starts to make some kind of signs of recovery and is moved to the high dependency unit for, for neuro. And she's there for quite a long period of time. And at this point, because she's showing signs of recovery, um, there's lots of physiotherapists involved in rehabilitation. Again, researchers, they're doing all sorts of assessments and all this, trying to get her back to being functional. And then after what is probably months of treatment, she ends up under my care with the team that I'm working for. And I'm one of the many people in, in, her, in her team looking after her. And then over that period of time, she was probably with us for, for a few months um, before eventually being discharged to community care rehab. Um, so all good, all good. Now, when she was moved to the, the unit that I was working in, which is a lower dependency from, say, high dependency and intensive care, they brought in a Reiki healer, a Reiki healer. Now, there was a, the, the unit I was in was fairly open to having alternative healers and therapists come in of varying sorts. There were a number of rules that would have to be vetted. The, the unit is a closed unit. It's not one you can just walk into. It's not like a lot of the wards, people just wander in and out. This is one of those ones you can't just wander into it because it has degrees of security. More for infection control and because of the high risk that people can present to some of these patients and so forth because of the vulnerabilities that they have. And so people would have to be signed in and so forth. This Reiki healer um, was allowed in because one of the one of the conditions was you're not going to do anything that interferes with the treatment that we're doing. So basically, Reiki is like woo, woo, wave, bit of woo woo, waving the hands over. A number of my colleagues were trained in Reiki, so they were quite happy to to, to allow that to happen. And that Reiki healer came in probably two or three times a week, wave bit of the woo woo, waving the hands and shaking off the um, shaking off the bad energies, and um, would go away again. And I say eventually that patient recovered and was discharged out to community. Then I'm on a night shift, and this is quite a few months later. And I'm one of the things that would happen is people would bring in all their magazines from home. So on the night shifts where there's lots of hours of, of essentially just keeping an eye on everybody, um, magazines get read. So lots and lots of magazines get brought in, all, all things like the women's magazines, mostly. Um, people didn't want my gun magazines. I noticed that people didn't really want those. And I'm reading a magazine and it's the center spread and the headline caught my attention. Um, after my head injury, I won't give the mechanism of the head injury, after my uh, accident, um, the doctors gave up on me and said I had no chance of survival, or said I wouldn't live, that kind of stuff. I would never walk again. And Reiki saved my life. And that caught my attention and I looked at, and then I saw the photos and I thought, she, she looks very familiar to me. It's this same person. And we've got a double page spread. And in that page spread, what we have is the story that basically says no one really expected her to live. Everyone gave up on her at the hospital. But it was okay because the Reiki healer came in on a daily basis and saved the, saved the day. And the whole attribution was given over to Reiki. I just found that absolutely staggering. I went and ran out of the office, showed my colleagues, have you, have you seen this? Now this is something that happens a lot. And I know of a number of people within the alternative, the talking therapies, whether it's NLP or EMDR, IEMT, all those, all those kind of areas, the alphabet therapies, as I call them. I have met over the years a number of people who claim they had had cancer or some hideous disease, and it was healed by the NLP, by the EMDR, by the EFT or whatever. And that's the story they tell, and people repeat that story. So hell, some of these things make it into magazines, some of them make it into little documentaries on, on the internet and so forth. And these stories get repeated. Yet when I've spoken to some, not all of those people, but I've spoken to some of those people and I asked the question, did you have medical treatment? Yes. Did you have chemotherapy, radiotherapy or surgery? Y yes. But it was the NLP that saved your life. Really? 
Because again, what we have is an issue of correlation is not causation. Now, I'm not dismissing that we can improve recovery through these other alternative treatment processes and programs and all the rest of it. And I'm not going to doubt for one second that when people are in a much more positive frame of mind and are dealing with their past traumas and all that kind of stuff we can work with psychologically, they're going to maximize their chances of recovery. But I don't believe for one second this causes recovery. I have seen too many counter examples. I have known people who are as miserable, they are miserable, horrible people with limiting beliefs and they've got nothing nice to say about them and they, about anybody. They drink and they smoke, they never have a healthy diet and they seem to have a really miserable fucking life. And they live in, you know, they live a ripe old age of 80. And I've met plenty of people who are really upbeat and positive and then the next thing you know, pancreatic cancer, off they go. The alternative therapy world has this notion that we only die because we have a bad mindset. <laughs> we only get ill because of our limiting beliefs. And if we all just have this wonderful frame of reference of the world, then we're gonna live forever. Just have a little look at the narcissistic people telling you those things. And Hello, Andy Austin. Yeah, speaking, how can I help? So just have a look at who is it that is telling you that you can be healed with their particular stuff. Who is it that is claiming to work with cancer patients? To work, it'll be long COVID next, I can, I can tell you, because so many people have got long COVID problems, I'm one of those people. There will be people peddling their, their wares to try and bring in that market. There's always someone trying to make money from somebody else's sickness. And, and this is a, a bigger sickness in itself, this narcissistic thing, which is, I can heal you. Those doctors, those researchers, those big farmers, those, they, they're closed-minded. They don't know what they're doing. They don't help anyone. They're just in it for the money. Yeah, right. Um, how many courses? <laughs> how many courses are you selling? And how expensive are they? If you notice how expensive the training courses are, thousands of pounds just to listen to a man talking from the stage, you might want to just reevaluate what you're getting into here. And why is it so expensive? Um, and what do they do with all that money? Oh, because, yeah, that's what it costs. As always, do use the comment section below. Interested in your thoughts on this.